All right. Good morning. Uh, we're going to be joined here by Tim Getzinger, Chris Anderson, and Dan McHugh. So we'll ask you to come up, please. Um, today's discussion is to work through a proposed executive regulation, 517, called Troubled Properties. And this follows on the legislation that the County Council passed uh, about two years ago, I think now, Bill 1915, which was a landmark tenants' rights legislation initiative that uh, we really, uh, it was a very heavy lift. It was a very substantial project that took us a good amount of time to work through, not because we were dilly-dallying and going slow, but because there was a lot of challenging issues in that bill and uh, you know where it was it, how it was introduced uh, there was a lot of aspects of it frankly that were somewhat unrealistic but we worked our way through and we framed it up and we put something together that was really really substantial uh, and important and it, it addresses the housing circumstances for such a large share of the county I think is it close to 40 percent of the counties are renters is that right something close to that 35, 40, um, right? Depends on the location. There are places where it's much higher, places where it's lower. Uh, as the packet notes, we have 77,000 units that are subject to the requirements of the legislation that we passed. So that is a huge share of our affordable housing, or of our housing, I should say. And what I certainly took away from it all was that uh, the, the crucial importance of maintaining the quality of that housing. And you can't talk about affordable housing and the need to have affordable housing in the county without focusing on the quality of the housing that you have. And that's where so many initiatives come into play, whether it's code inspection or uh, other types of tenants' rights, helping them improve the quality, helping tenants to advocate for themselves and improve the quality of their housing. There is an underlying issue of civic participation. We, we need tenants to be assertive uh, about their circumstances, to uh, to tell us when we need help. Uh, and there are also, uh, unfortunately, some limitations on how much we can, you know, rely upon that. So striking a balance where we have a very strong code inspection regime and we're in the buildings regularly uh, is really, really important. Um, and uh, so the, the, the regulation here is a follow-up on a piece of that. And... We're going to get an update. Linda's going to walk us through what the major provisions of it are. Um, and uh, in, the la in the latter stages of doing that legislation, Councilmember Hucker proposed a significant addition to the, department, the department's budget to add code inspection and other staff support. Um, so as we were working our way through and really understanding the, 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 the role of code inspection in the overall policy agenda, uh, it was a ter uh, really helpful addition to the conversation that, you know, we just don't have enough personnel here. We need to, to beef up and, and allow us to really fulfill our goal. So uh, I think close to a million dollars was added uh, to the county budget that year, and um, the department hired about, I think you just said 15, 14 code inspectors and 14 new positions. 14 positions. Nine were Nine were code inspectors, and then and he had like a outreach, tenant outreach, um, an IT person, uh, supervisor. Right. So a few, a few essential personnel in this same arena uh, to really uh, expand what we're doing there. So um, again, this is absolutely essential to our housing policy goals and our affordable housing policy goals, ensuring that. The market affordable housing that we have is quality. That you know, there's probably nothing more important for the affordable housing agenda in some respects than just ensuring that what we have is quality, uh, and that it you know it, it's it's housing that people are you know that we we can uh, feel proud that they live in. That's a that's a you know big challenge for any community. Uh, my colleagues have any comments? If not, we'll go to Linda to uh, take us through the packet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Linda. Okay. So I would just start, um, Councilmember Reamer has touched on this, but Bill 1915 
um, did several things. On the first page of your packet, I just have noted some of the specific types of violations that were discussed in the bill as being severe violations. Um, rodent or inf insect infestation affecting 20% or more of the units in a building, extensive invisible mold growth, windows that do not permit for safe means of egress, pervasive and recurring water leaks, um, the result of con chronic dampness, mold growth, um, lack of one or more working utilities that wasn't shut off due to tenant non-payment. So in the bill, there was quite a discussion um, about what would be sort of the most severe types of things. There's, so, so first let me say, Chapter 26 of the County Code has an extensive list of housing um, requirements. And so there's an extensive list. In the discussion of Bill 1915, we had a discussion of what were like the most severe kinds of conditions that really needed attention, they needed follow-up inspections, they needed a corrective action plan. So these are the kinds of categories um, that were included. And in your packet, I did include a copy of um, Bill 1915, and on circle um, 56 is where you would see at the top that there is also a requirement that there be regulations that would establish a category called troubled properties. And the troubled properties would um, classify the violation types by severity, and they would rate the properties by the severity of the violations and the quantity of the violations. And for then for those properties that met a certain threshold, which is the subject of the regulation, the director would have a corrective action plan um, and there would be inspections and annual inspections until the plan is successfully completed. And so the goal here was to, to make, um, to categorize certain things to get to this troubled property. Now, the, right now we don't have anything classified as a troubled property because we don't have the regulation, but I did also want to say um, that included in your packet, Bill 1915 first required um, the department to come over and tell us how they were going to go through the two-year inspection plan, and they did that. And then last September, they did provide the first of the annual reports, and that is in your packet. And so while there are technically right now troubled properties, that particular report also included an attachment that showed properties, this is on Circle 51, that they were going to subject to annual inspections. And so when the department brought this over, uh, last fall, they had already started to, um, without a regulation in place, started to discuss what might fall, what properties might fall into this um, classification formally once the regulation is adopted. So I just wanted to be clear that just because we don't have a categorization, it doesn't mean that the department hadn't specifically been looking at properties where they found more significant um, violations That's important, already. actually, because I think there's been some comments made as though the department wasn't really moving on this agenda. But, I, you know, it, it appears to me that, that the department was moving on this agenda. Yes. So everything to date, the department has been in compliance since the bill was enacted with all the requirements of the bill, even if the specific regulation to categorize something wasn't in place. So, Linda, is it your judgment that the department was fulfilling the requirements of the legislation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that some comments have been made about the former director, who I thought was just fantastic, and I, I really wish he was continuing in his role. Uh, he's not here today, and I'm probably going to keep mentioning his name for a while because I really miss him. Clarence Knox, he was great, and I'm glad to hear the department was moving forward on its work. This is they're important work. And they're okay, still they're moving forward on their work. This still, is important work. Still doing it. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, the, the report that you get each year now, as you'll see from the one that came last year, is very thorough in all, listing out all of the properties, all the properties that, you know, were inspected in a year, all the properties that are expected to be expect, inspected. Um, and as I say, for this last report, they had an attachment with annual inspections. Um, now in the coming report, you would have something that would tell you what the troubled properties are that had corrective action plans. Okay. Okay. So I don't know if you have any, did, did you have any overview questions that you want to I think to we may have a few, first? so uh, I'll just start on one side and then we'll go there. Mr. Juwanda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. This, this was really helpful. Uh, 
report, uh, Linda, an update on everything. And thank you all for being here. Uh, I was so. If, if I'm correct, then, Linda, this is kind of the troubled property proposed list, and not to put words in your mouth, but based on the work that we've already, has already been done by the department. I think the expectation would be if they had the regulation in place, you would have expected to see these properties be troubled properties. Right. Great. Uh, and I know we're going to hear from you all, but I just, you know, just starting off, this is obviously very important. Uh, as the chairman mentioned, for so many reasons, I was happy to, happy, unhappy, to join the code inspection that uh, you did at Enclave, you know, just down the street from my house there in White Oak. Um, and I know we'll probably hear, or I'd love to hear a little bit about how that went. Um, but this is, a, this is a great piece of legislation that needs to be acted upon. Uh, as I look at this list, um, you know, 11 of these, uh, places are in, are in Silver Spring. Um, many of them are in the eastern part of the county. I actually, I actually lived in one of them uh, growing up in Quebec Terrace. And uh, so this list is not unfamiliar. You have ch places like Charter House, which is a senior facility, and they've been complaining since I've been involved in civic life to me about the quality of, of their housing um, and have some great advocates there. So this is uh, this is not a surprising list to me. We have Flower Branch Apartments, which are the, we all know are the apartments where uh, you had people lose their lives two years ago, uh, and many others are, were displaced. So there's real life consequences when we don't have, you don't have the resources you need to have code enforcement, uh, and that we're not uh, taking this seriously. I, I look at this regime of affordable housing as carrot and stick, right? You need to provide opportunities for rehabilitation and new development in areas, because some buildings after time do get to the point where they're hard to maintain. But you also need to have the stick regime, which is the code enforcement regime. So I'm, I'm very interested in making sure you have what you need uh, to get this done within the legislation and within this regulation, uh, because this is so critical. It literally is life and death as the case of the Flower Branch Apartments that we have right here. So thank you all. for Thank you, Linda, and I look forward to speaking with you all more. Thank you. Uh, I um, appreciate this. It was really helpful because a lot of, you know, what I had been under the pressure under the impression of is that there wasn't a lot of the enforcement that was supposed to be happening that was uh, that was happening. And uh, clearly, here at least according to staff, it seems like there has been uh, quite a bit. And I think um, you know, I think it's important for folks to realize that. I mean, there are always opportunities to improve, and look forward to having those conversations. But I think this. Particularly for that, beyond you know the broader uh, topic, not just the, the you know this particular regulation, I think was helpful for me as a new council member to kind of really understand what we are doing uh, currently and to clarify some uh, information, some of which I think is not entirely accurate that I was under the impression of. And so I appreciate the work of the department and the work of uh, staff to help me learn that. I do have uh, a couple questions and uh, just a general comment. I think the uh, kind of on the heels of the uh, eviction conversation that we had, not just the you know, state legislation, but the OLO report, which I think was really enlightening to learn uh, in depth about that uh, issue. Uh, it was very clear that uh, it was a very small number of properties that we were talking about. So I think it's important uh, in this uh, conversation that uh, we recognize that the vast majority of uh, building owners play by the rules, do the right thing, they keep their properties uh, in good working order, they provide a really good place for uh, folks to live, and I think that it's important that we, you know, advertise that and, and and share that. And I think for the sake of residents and the sake of the vast majority of building owners who do do the right thing, that it's important that we enforce those who aren't uh, doing the right thing and aren't reinvesting back in their property and aren't providing, you know, safe and livable conditions uh, for their for their folks. So. I have two uh, quick uh, questions here. One um, is related to the information to tenants. So you know, one of the challenges that we have is tenants you know, can be hard to reach on, on issues like this. They have trouble uh, getting to uh, their, you know, their information to county government and to their elected officials. And some of it is I think we have you know, trouble reaching them. Is there any aspect of this about uh, making sure that we are getting information from the tenants about potential issues that are coming up as part of these 
uh, inspections and any any effort to do you know proactive outreach to the tenants. And um, once we do an inspection and we find issues, and there is a, a plan which can be a positive result of some of their uh, concerns that are raised. Is there any uh, effort or part of this uh, program or plan in place to you know contact those residents in these communities to let them know that there is a plan in place and these are the uh, improvements that are expected to make their living environment better. Hi there, Tim Getzinger, Acting Director for DHCA. Um, so there's a, there's a few things that we're working on right now. Um, in, I believe, uh, January 1st, we went ahead and we um, pushed out again the Renters Have Rights uh, outreach campaign. And so we have ads on the back of buses and bus shelters and senior centers and a lot of different places. And so it's a way to let people know that we are listening to their concerns and if they have any kind of issues, it's free, it's confidential, they can be anonymous. That's one aspect. And being out at the Enclave meeting, I was asking around to a number of different tenants, how do they, how do they get their information? Because me, I'm more of a website-driven person. And so as we move forward with the troubled property list, we'll have everything online in two different places. One, Data Montgomery. It's just a good place to have a lot of granular data there. Uh, but we're also creating our own website um, that includes everything that a person would want to see. One, you know, a summary of the rights and responsibilities for tenants and for landlords, the actual troubled property list, uh, information regarding some of the services that we have with code enforcement and with landlord tenant and some more information there. And we'll be, um, once the troubled property list is approved, when it is approved, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll turn that live. It's in beta right now. But the other approved thing- by the- The county council, the, the executive regulation. The regulation is approved, yes. not the list of properties. Yes. We don't have yeah. a role in that. I'm sorry, yes. Um, but the other thing that came up during the Enclave meetings is that you know people don't necessarily go on websites to get information. And some people, you just need to be down on the ground um, and, and, and make sure that you have a presence there. And so one of the things that this regulation does when we have the troubled property list is that it identifies certain areas in certain neighborhoods, um, just like the eviction study did. Um, you know, It says that you need to be in certain areas that are some of the more concentrated issues are. And so uh, we are hiring a new tenant advocate. Um, we are working with existing tenant advocates. Um, we have a- right, you're, you're hiring a staff position. Staff position. Advocate, but yes. you also have contracts for organizations to provide tenant exactly. advocacy. Is that-, is that yes. um, And we also have, um, as alluded to before, one of the 14 positions that were hired was a code outreach coordinator. And uh, between that, um, we plan on being on the ground more often at these properties to have regular meetings, um, like at Charter House every two weeks, every month with management, um, with maintenance to make sure that everybody's on the same page and is doing what they need to do. Because I think that we need to have a both a global presence, but also be on the ground in certain areas. And so that's that's the next step. So what's the difference between the tenant advocate position and the contracts that, you know, the work that the, the organizations do on contract? Sure. Some of the t uh, different things that the tenant advocate could do is actually work in between. And um, when we say that we're going to be doing um, some eviction focus, um, it's that. It's um, providing um, certain subsidies, rental subsidies. It's being the person who is responsible in DHCA for that function, it's important to have somebody who is the, the leader of that, um, and then would also be, of course, uh, monitoring those other contracts that we have. We have a number of tenant advocate contracts and other folks that provide those services. Perfect. Andrew? Yeah, just uh, one of the concerns that was uh, raised was the, you know, the characterization of referring to these as troubled properties. Is there... Um, we're we're going to get we're oh, going to get to that. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you okay. want, I mean, sorry. Why don't we proceed with this? Because that's that's the only issue that I think you know there might be some discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a few questions okay. about that, but we can, I, I'll wait till we're ready. How far are we? We're not quite to that point in the packet, Linda. So um, why don't we why don't we hold off on that? Sure. Uh, and then come back to it. Um, I, I have one other question. Sure. sure. Then. Uh, just uh, the attachment four that, uh, Linda, you were uh, referencing before with the annual inspections, mm -hmm. 
uh, some of them say open case without any violations, but they're on that annual inspection list. So I was just curious if I could get an explanation of why something that didn't have any violations <coughs> but would potentially be on the annual inspection list, which I read it and maybe I read it wrong, that those are the potential troubled properties as the result of the current inspections that are taking place. If you could just explain that to me, it just seemed a little incongruent. So troubled property in terms of this regulation is just a property that has a higher number of violations and a higher severity. Uh, it scores out to that particular ranking um, so that they, they just have more of it. There's also properties that we know that have a history um, and maybe there are not a lot of violations now, but if we're not there and if we don't have a presence, those properties are more likely to fall back into that level. And so these were historical inspections. They had problems, and so you're going back regularly. They're kind of like on probation. You're like making sure, trust but verify. So, so the properties will be on an annual inspection list. Hopefully, they would have corrected all of their violations well before the next annual inspection, so you could have properties that end up on this list because at the time they had severe and many, and then they get corrected, but they'll still stay on that <coughs> annual inspection until the next inspection comes up. And how long, is that just till the next inspection, till they've been fully cleared annually, or is there a period of time that we keep these buildings on the list until they've repeatedly shown that they're keeping up and then we move on and focus elsewhere. Yeah, once Dan McHugh, manager, um, with the open, with, with no violations, that may have been a, a, a point of time when this was created. Um, once the violations have been corrected, the case is closed, and then a subsequent inspection is determined dependent upon the severity. So that would be the annual for the following year. Um, until they meet all of the criteria, and they have the correction action plan and so forth, and that's been cleared, then they'll be, they'll be coming off depending upon once the severity table is, is reduced. So it's a case-by-case -case basis case -by -case. depending on what type of violation it is, depends right. on how long they stay on the list. Right. All of our violations have a category severity uh, table with them. So your life safety would be, health and safety would be, you know, missing smoke detectors, CO detectors, maybe uh, would be categorized as a five. And then like your lower type of violations, like painting a, a unit uh, might be like a one or a two. So we have that spelled out in, in, the, uh, in the reg also as far as what the severity levels are. So typically the higher the severity, the higher you know, types of violations, those would then be calculated into possibly an annual inspection based on the reg. And so I think if you, if you wanted to look at circle five and six, um, in the memo, I noted for you the health and safety violations, um, and then it also has the higher priority violations. So what you'll see, some of those, uh, you know, are ones where DHCA had to use the powers under designation of unfit dwelling or an unsafe residential, um, severe conditions, missing disabled or non-functioning smoke detectors, broken entrance door or missing broken locks, HVAC system not maintaining a temperature of 68 degrees in a heating month, um, and any other violation designated on the list. But then what you'll see in the regulation is that there's also categorized for medium priority and lower priority, and that gets into this point system that they're implementing, which would allow them then to categorize by the points attached to the number of violations and the number of violations to see how they get to something that's a troubled property. Yeah, I saw the priority. I just wasn't sure how that related to the follow-up in terms of annual reports and so forth. But. Yeah. So, and I actually did want to note for you one thing since you're, you know, um, the heating, I put a little footnote here for you because I do want to just mention that a health and safety violation around heating is a health and safety violation. Right now, there is no requirement about cooling in buildings where, um, you know, it's a central system. So I would just say this is an issue that comes up now as more buildings don't have windows that open. Um, you know, you have buildings where people count on their air conditioning, right? They can't just open their window. We so agree. that is something that as we move through talking about 
um, code as, over the next few months. I just, just wanted to mention this to you right now because right now we're in the winter months and you would get concerns if somebody's heat didn't work, but in the summer months, oftentimes we get concerns when a building's air conditioning doesn't work and currently there is no um, standard around that. So. We hear from DHCA on that issue. That's a, you hear a lot about heat waves causing very serious health issues, even death, uh, especially among vulnerable people. What's uh, any comments on why we don't have a standard there? Do other jurisdictions have standards? I'm unaware of any others that have standards for that. Uh -huh. um, I know typically in the changeover season, there's that, you know, magical, there's no magical date as far as, you know, May 12th needs to be changed over. Um, I know we do, uh, once we do start receiving complaints during that period of time, we, we reach out to the uh, property owners to see when they're going to turn it back on. Um, a lot of times they want to get out of the heating system, the heating, se heating season, because of the costs. The chillers would be a little less to, to, to operate and so forth. Um, it's just that magical, you know, once you see the forecast, the outrange forecast, that's when they pretty much uh, change over the, uh, the systems. Uh, but we're, are we speaking just about the changeover issue or just in general? So there's, uh, there's two, so, so there's several kinds. So all, all the buildings have to provide heat, right? And yeah. then in some of our older buildings, either individual units might still have individual, you know, window units in some of the older buildings or their windows open. Right. Um, and then there's a series of buildings where you had central systems and they have to turn from heat to cool and cool to heat. And every year, um, you know, sometimes we get complaints if there's a particularly hot day that comes and they can't change the this system is, over. This is a bigger problem more and more, right? right? With this erratic but, extreme right. weather, you could have 70 and, degree days right. in January and then... Right. And then some, some, in some of those buildings are old enough that windows do still open. But I think the other thing now is you have a lot of buildings where you don't really <laughs> have a lot of open window ventilation. Um, they're more sealed buildings and you count on your HVAC systems to keep you warm and cool. And so, um, you know, it's not a subject of this regulation, but since one of the health and safety violations is about heat, I just wanted to, you know, let you know that this is there an is issue no that you hear about. There is no violation for cooling. Right. So you can't cite a building. Is that what you're saying, Dan? Or Only if it's damaged. Not Only if the system is damaged. Right. Is damaged. If they just haven't turned it on, you can't cite them on right. that issue. We do, you know, have conversations with them to try to, you know, get them to get it on as soon as possible. Um, the changeover, you know, normally is a couple of days. Right. And independent. Well, you hear about it in schools a lot. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's a real calculation not, for the schools when they when they turn it over. Right. And office buildings. Office yeah. Buildings. Yeah. Uh, I want to welcome Tom. We've, we've described a bit about the addition to the budget that you proposed for the code inspectors and highlighted that issue. Any, any comments you want to make? Um, I don't know if I have any comments, and I'll probably have more questions, but just before you left this very important point, um, maybe I missed it, Dan, but is there, is there a reason the county exec didn't include air conditioning, not the, not the changeover unit, the, the, the turnover issue and what date that occurs, but why, why not HVAC is the lack yeah, of so. HVAC isn't a... Exactly. just like the lack of work and heating. There's no temperature yeah. requirement under Chapter 26 as of today. Right. There, as of today. It's, it's, right. Just, it's just for heating. In this, but we can't amend it in the regulation. Correct. It has to be in the legislation. Right. There's nothing in Chapter 26 that would allow them to issue a violation. Um, there is for heat. There's specifics around heat. Um, so that's why I just wanted to make sure as we go through. Well, let's highlight this issue. Other council members yeah. want to talk about it. If you feel like it's something we need, then you should tell us that. And yeah. Will? No, I was just going to say, I, as we're moving in the climate change, global warming environment, uh, you know, this is critical. And, and Linda's point about windows not opening, um, I think we need to know that. You know, I, I'd like to get a, a, out in front of that, knowing, you know, we can't control necessarily the switchover date, but what are the other things that the building and the owners are doing to make sure that the place remains habitable, right? You know, like IE being able to open up a window. Uh, so do we know, do we have a handle on, for example, of the properties where that's the case and where it's not and that kind of thing? Well, uh, yeah. and what I'm saying about windows is in, in buildings that have windows that are supposed to open, it's a violation if they don't. If they don't, correct. Right. But, you know, as buildings are designed differently now, you don't have big wide open windows, right? right? So 
it, it's just a change in how things are designed. They're more designed to count on central yeah. HVAC. Systems. No, I get that, and I've lived in those buildings where they do the switchover. I just think we need to think, to right. Chairman's point, about what, how can we be looking ahead at things that we're going to need to think about as it gets warmer sooner and it's more erratic. Uh, windows are a part of it. When does it switch over? What are your other mechanisms for providing uh, you know, cooling opportunities? So I just think we need to, we need to have something. And I, I wouldn't want to legislate or regulate on it until we did the little analysis. I'm assuming this isn't unique just to us here in the county. I'm sure other people are dealing with this. So I think I would turn it on you all to maybe do some landscape analysis to see how people are confronting this. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify because I'm a little confused on the windows. We're talking about the same thing. We have the same problem in some schools, not in Montgomery County necessarily because our schools are, are, but in other parts of the state where there's air conditioning issues and you have, these are, these are like the suicide prevention windows that don't open, right? There was this move in buildings to not allow people to, to, to open their window enough that a child or, you know, an adult could, could get out of that window, which is a building change. The, the unintended consequence there is on a hot day, if you don't have air conditioning, you literally can't open the window enough. But those are, th those are like relatively newer buildings, right? That, that would have the windows that don't open. I mean, is that a, I mean, I think s separately is this, whether or not uh, cooling is just as much an issue as heating in terms of health and safety. I think that's a fair conversation with us to have. I just want to clarify the the window piece here in terms of, you know, most of these properties, I presume, just looking at the list, are older properties. Is the, you know, the windows not opening a whole lot? Is these a, are not is, the properties where you necessarily will get the complaints about the air conditioning. Is a, is a newer building. No. Well, a lot of the high rises, they would only open right. six, eight inches or so. Right. Right. You know, if you got a high rise, you don't want them opening all the way. Right. Um, you know, a lot of the smaller complexes, the six, eight plexes, you know, they may have individual units in there. Right. So it's a little bit of a. And the high. And a lot the, of the newer high rises, you know, typically those windows are, are probably, you know, won't, won't even open. Right. But that is that there, do we, are we having a lot of issues with those high rise, newer high rise units with cooling outside of the when do they turn it on, which we, I guess, are talking about that being a different issue than it not working or not having it at all? I think a lot of the complaints are from the older buildings. Yeah, that's what I would think. Older okay. Buildings. I just want to clarify that. Thanks. Okay. Let's continue with the packet. So, um, so the regulation has these different categories of high, medium, and lower level. Um, they have provided a methodology that would give you the uh, score for the severity of violations, and that gets to this point system. And then they would give you a score on the total number of violations. And then what you see is that they would do an analysis of this, and those that sort of fall into that quadrant would be the ones that are considered troubled properties. Um, and they would be subject to the corrective action plans and um, the inspections and the notifications. Um, I did want to say um, to Council Member Friedson, the regulation, uh, once something is designated as a troubled property, there is notice to the landlord. There's not in the regulation notice to all the tenants. Now, tenants who have a violation in their unit are notified because it's for their unit. Um, the department also notifies tenants when there's something in a common area that would impact tenants, but there isn't a notification to all tenants the way the regulation is written. It's not a requirement that, like, all tenants would be notified if you landed on the troubled property. I didn't know if that was one of the issues that um, you were asking about. Yeah, that's exactly what I was asking. I read that note. Same okay. Thing. I just wanted to clarify. Right. Um, and so, uh, so I've, I've looked at the proposal, and for myself, um, what I was recommending to the committee is I think that it is – it's quite a reasonable way to begin. I think you actually have to begin, um, have them do this analysis, come back with the September report. If then we see that, you know, something's not falling into the categories the way we want it, I know the department's also open to going back and looking and seeing if adjustments need to be made. It may be that we have more experience about, you know, like time to correct violations, other things that you might want to consider. 
but I found that the regulation was reasonable and I would recommend approval. There is a um, technical um, correction that has to come over, so an amended version would come over to you, and then if you had any suggestions on other things that you would uh, like to have in the regulation, you, we can ask the executive for that and then see if they would send that over as an amendment, such as the notice issue. Okay, such as the? The notice issue, notice to tenants. Any other issues that we might want to see added or? Um, okay. I kind well, of yeah. just one. So just to ask the, just to confirm, I just want to make sure I'm clear. And you may, if you, you were clear, I probably am just unclear. The list that, that we have here in the packet is use this analysis of the regulation or no? No. Okay, no. The regulation no. was not in place. Okay. Right. But it didn't, so this tiered analysis, this is just based on what you all thought might be things you want to look out for. And how, how, how congruent would that, is that in your mind with the regulation as written? Would, this, would that yield the same list is my question? I don't know. Um, we do have the trouble property list. I'm not sure if all 10 or 15 properties are on this. These are properties that we know. You have a separate list that's not here now because it's not ready because the regulation isn't approved. Exactly. Um, these properties have a history of having a These high, 14 here listed. Have a, have a history of having higher severity uh, violations and a higher number. Um, whether or not all 14 would be on the current trouble property list, I couldn't tell you right now. Um, the trouble property list itself is just a way of prioritizing <coughs> inspections. The purpose of it is to, you know, there's scarce resources and economically speaking, we need to find a way to say, all right, these are the buildings that we'll be inspecting on an annual basis. And we're doing that because, well, they had worse comparatively, um, inspection results in other properties. And so these are troubled properties. We're going to be looking at them more. We'll be inspecting them at least once a year. They'll have to report more often. They'll have to provide us with maintenance logs. They'll have to provide us with a report that says not only how they're going to correct the violations that we found, but how are they going to go ahead and make it so that there aren't um, ongoing issues. But aside from this specific troubled property list, there are also it needs to be another way of saying, all right, maybe you didn't necessarily fall on it, but we know that we need to pay more attention to this property. Um, and so that's that's kind of the purpose and, of it. And this regulation obviously doesn't preclude you from continuing to inspect any. Exactly. If you get a, a flurry of complaints or you historical analysis, you can still use whatever criteria you want to go back and check on others. This would just be an additional frame or lens to help you prioritize. And the landlord is required to provide a quarterly report. If they're a troubled property, the landlord is required to provide a quarterly report back to the department. So that's another aspect What's of being that on that report? list. The status of the corrective? Is yeah, that what, what the plan? Mm -hmm. the corrective action plan will do. Mm -hmm. And that plan would not change under this, that, this corrective action plan that's listed in the regulation would be the same one that you currently require? <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, that's helpful. And then just another thing on the, when you get complaints from tenants, from residents, what's the threshold? I'm sure it varies, but do you have an internal policy of, you know, what, how many you need to get before you go out and, and do an inspection? No, we, I mean, all complaints we would inspect right. um, just you know, within seven, ten days at the, at, at the, at the most. Um, there's no rationale right now. That's why this this is definitely helpful. Right. You know, where we would look in the past, you know, okay, we had how many complaints this year for this property? Let's go out and do an annual or biannual, so forth. This here is going to let us get drilled down to right. the top core of what where the problem. Do some analysis, put it exactly. in the framework. Okay, right. and use use resources better. Thank you. Okay. Um, Aoba did give you some comments. Yeah. So let's talk about this issue. So Aoba. Uh, has suggested that this phrase of, uh, hey, Nicola, would you like to come join us? Um, they have some concerns. Did you want to make a comment? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think my comment was more questions than comment. The, the issue was raised, and I was just, you know, I guess the general framework, and Aoba may have the answer to this, or, or you uh, may, but one is, you know, what are, what are juris other jurisdictions 
do? What, what do they call it? What's the real world implication? Is there a financing or other uh, issue, you know, related to this that we should be, you know, concerned about? And, um, you know, I guess those are my two main, main questions and AOBA may have the answer. So our, um, you introduce yourself. Oops, sorry, my name is Nicola Whiteman. I am the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs with the Apartment and Office Building Association. Um, first, I mean, in terms of the, the thrust of, of the overall uh, proposal, I mean, we support that it's important for tenants and to live in safe and habitable homes. Now, to your question of how jurisdictions um, handle this, I'm not aware of any other jurisdiction, and I could look and ask my colleagues of any jurisdiction that has a kind of a troubled property designation. Now what the district does, for example, they do have a proactive inspection program, and it's the same concept. Um, theirs is a little newer than Montgomery County's, but the idea that properties that are in compliance um, are on a five-year inspection cycle, and so well, they don't call it a Total property, but in, in, in essence, properties are subject to more frequent inspections and annual inspection, in, in essence, if they don't comply. So that's how they approach it. So when you add kind of this additional layer of calling it a trouble property, um, our concern is really, and more for, for the residents and us, is, is our ability to get financing. So we may have a member that's assuming management of a property that has a history or that maybe was not maintained to a certain standard and be their ability to get financing to correct those conditions to bring their property up to a certain standard. Uh, will we, you know, will that property be able to get financing? Will it be subject to a higher interest rate if it's considered a riskier investment? Um, but I think the thrust of the, of the program, you know, th that it's a, a, a property or properties on the list that's subject to more frequent inspections is still important and you still preserve that and it's still consistent with the statutory intent that these are, these are properties that are subject to more scrutiny because of certain standards, the, the quality of the, the violations, the quantity of violations as determined by the department. Okay. Um, so, Linda, can you just give us a little background here? The legislation called for... So the legislation uses the term troubled property, mm -hmm. so, um, and it requires a regulation for troubled property. I did speak with our attorney who said that if there was a desire, we could define, um, you could create a new category with a different name, like a high intensity inspection property or whatever it is he wanted to say. And then you could define that in the regulation as a troubled property and then DHCA could use that in its um, public you know, like it, on the website or other so things. The, they could use a different it's, it's term. It's troubled property is sort of right. behind the scene designation. It's public designation. <laughs> would, is, if you wanted to actually get rid of the whole term troubled property, you'd have to go back into the law. I think there's a way of doing it in terms of how the, you know, without necessarily going through a statutory change, maybe it's, it's through the regulations as property subject to more frequent inspections or frequently inspected properties. Because the thrust of it is the same, is that, you know, you, you fail to meet a certain standard um, and so you'll be subject to more scrutiny by the agency. Uh, Will? Uh, thank you for the clarification. Thank you for being here, Nicola. I, so I, I'm a little uh, confused on this. So presumably if the concern is that financing for a new owner coming in to trying to correct, I, I would think that the banks and others would would be able to see through this distinction pretty easily. It's a, if you're getting inspected frequently every year, I mean, they're going to be able to know which are the troubled trouble properties, whatever you call it, whatever the semantics are. I really see the benefit of this is if I'm a prospective tenant and I want to go to the county's troubled property list, that, that's where the confusion might happen in my perspective. I don't think the very, you know, the bankers and the people who are providing financing are going to have any problem finding with the troubled properties and seeing and doing their due diligence. So I think if I'm a prospective tenant, I want to be able to go quickly and see where have ha where have they had issues and, and and that's where I think there could be. So could you comment on that? I, mean, I think you could do both. I mean, I think your your issues right now, my understanding from what well, first let me address the, the the resident aspect. I think what the agency has indicated is that the, that information will be publicly available whether you call it frequently inspected or or whatever that, you know, a, a resident will be able to go on there. Um, our concern is, you know, we, we have members that again, you know, their experience has been, you know, they will um, they they might be uh, you know, either discourage investment because you if 
a higher interest rate and suddenly it becomes more costly to kind of correct these conditions or take over these properties that might need the necessary investment um, from, you know, the, uh, a company that's going to, you know, maintain that to a certain standard. But wouldn't that be the, that's what I'm saying is, wouldn't that be the case either way? I think the people who well, are I guess providing going through, investment Well, because this is know. a new program, um, you know, the idea of calling it a triple, and now you're going to be putting these properties on an annual inspection. There's, there, you're right, there's, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about how uh, financial institutions will react to that um, because, you know, the folks, at least the EO members, they're looking to invest and maintain and preserve and make sure these properties are safe and habitable. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of um, uh, anxiousness about how financial institutions uh, will react and, and in possible, you know, an impact the, the interest rates that might be associated with lending for a particular property. Well, I, I, okay. I just and then I and then I you know the other issue that was raised is just um, th that that's the housing provider perspective, uh, the reaction or I guess concerns about residents if you're living in a property that's designated as triple. What what does that mean for residents as well? So I think there there are concerns on on both sides in terms of on on our side it's really financing because our members are trying to go in and make sure those properties are well maintained and then also if we use the kind of label trouble what does that mean for the residents? Well, I, I I think you know like I said having lived in one of these where I was scared to go to the bathroom because there were roach roaches and rodents on the ground, I knew something was wrong. It might have helped me at the time and helped some advocates in, the, in that building to know that someone else thought, <coughs> thought it was wrong and that wasn't how you're supposed to live. So on the resident side, I think it's a big priority to validate that these are troubled based on some objective standards. And just my question was, I think if you're a, someone proposing to finance, you're going to be able to weed through that list and find it either way. So I don't think that's going to be an issue, whether you call it high frequency property, inspected properties or troubled properties. So the people who are going to finance these projects are going to be able to go to either one of those lists and make their determination. So I, I, don't, I think it's mostly semantics. I think it is semantics. Uh, I think what, um, but what I'm hearing from Linda is if we had a different name for it, you wouldn't have a list of troubled properties. You would have a list of buildings subject to inspection and uh, so there wouldn't be a, two lists. But uh, I, I have to admit, I'm sort of torn on this. Like, you know, it, if we name it something different, then it, it would be pretty bad if you're a building owner to have your, your building on this list. And that would be pretty motivating to, right. that was the goal. Try, to yeah. try to address it. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, if you back down a little bit on that, uh, then, you know, um, would it really impact financing? It's hard to know. I mean, that's a legitimate concern. We, we wouldn't want to make it harder, but then we don't want to reduce the pressure either. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I appreciate that. I guess, I mean, I, I have no idea what banks would and wouldn't do. I'm not a banker, and I'm not sure any of us uh, here do, although I'm not sure. I, there, there are a lot of unique talents uh, on the council, some of which I'm still learning, and so uh, perhaps uh, we know things that, that I don't. I'm, I am curious, I, I guess the, the closest we could come to that, at least the folks who are in the room, is with DHCA, when, when you do the corrective work plans currently, do you run into issues where you're working with a landlord and that landlord has problems and the problems are costly and has trouble getting financing and that is part of the back and forth because, you know, my view of this is, at least from the evictions OLO report that we saw and some of the other uh, others, you know, these are, tend to be certain properties, not necessarily property owners that own, you know, dozens of buildings. These are the smaller uh, property owners, at least that's what we heard from the previous, you know, conversation that we had. And so, you know, is that an issue that you're seeing? Is that something that you've seen up, up, up to this point? Because, I mean, I think that would be valuable. Well, I think that the troubled property list, it really is more about semantics and it's about education and having folks to understand what exactly does it mean to be a troubled property. I'm not sure that having the label troubled property or more frequently inspected property, how that would impact financing. I think that banks probably look more at cash flow than whether or not they're on a list. Um, but I think the, the main property... That's helpful. That's helpful. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sorry to... Yeah. Jump. Well, um, so it, it has more to do with your ability to spin off cash and be able to cover debt service um, 
rather. I, I mean, I think that's going to be the primary thing that a, a bank is going to be looking at, you know, whether or not you can pay for the loan. Um, and that being said, yeah, we're doing more code enforcement and we're looking at some of the troubled properties. <coughs> and so some of them are going to be smaller. And that, that's actually the, the financing issue. It's, it's, it's not being on a list. It's actually having the ability um, to pay and to pay. Capitalizes their, exactly. is their ability. I get that. So just going back to the question, uh, and I appreciate what you're saying, and I think you're probably right that the, a, a bank's primary motivation is capitalization and the ability to pay back the loan. What goes into that is beyond my personal skill set, uh, which is admittedly limited. Um, but... Do you all work with buildings currently through your regular code enforcement process where bank loans, you know, working line of credit, you know, whatever the case may be, is a problem? So we're you know, where you're, they, they say, hey, we want to fix this. I don't have the money to do it. I'm trying to get a bank loan. We need some more time because the bank has rejected us. I mean, is that something that you see? We're working with a nonprofit uh, Montgomery Housing Partnership to provide some education and outreach to business owners that have a difficult time kind of meeting, uh, making ends meet. One of the things that they'll be able to do is through us, um, provide low interest loans to buildings that need it. And I mean, I think that that's- Who's gonna provide that, sorry? Well, the county will be, but we're working right. with Montgomery Housing Partnership to kind of figure out- Do the outreach it's aspect. To do the outreach. It. And it's through a program that we call the Rehab Program for Small Rental Properties. It's something that we had uh, many years ago that we've brought back um, to be able to help those buildings that have the needs. With but other, the other than that, this isn't an issue that you have dealt with, you know, where a property owner specifically has a code violation or something that needs to be remediated and they aren't able to get the financing and that's feedback that you get. No, that mostly, most of the time you'll see that from smaller properties with thinner margins. So you do see that sometimes. And that, and that would be the reason why we are um, pushing out the, the new program. Yes. Okay. So is it your view that the issue to get uh, private capital will be mitigated by the fact that the county is going to have this preferred low interest rate loan program for some of these properties potentially or I'm just I'm having trouble following the answer to the question to be honest with you sure. I, well I mean the main question is can folks make their needed repairs and if it's a larger larger property then yes most of the time that they can they have more units they have the proper debt service where we see it are the four plexes where you have four four units and very thin margins and they don't have the money they haven't had capital needs studies they probably haven't been investing in the property uh, as often or frequently as they should. And so we come out there and we find these issues and they don't have the cash. And had um, there been education and outreach and some financial literacy for them, this wouldn't have happened. And so we provide that outreach and that education along with a low interest loan um, to help them make those needed repairs. Can I, that's, sure. that's something you do or something you're going to do? You that's something that we're doing right now. Uh, if, I, if I could just add on to that, I'm Chris Anderson, the Chief of Community Development Division. Uh, in the past, when we've encountered one other alternative approach, when we've encountered a small uh, property owner that's not able to afford to make the repairs, uh, we have introduced them to a nonprofit who is um, who we would help to finance a purchase of the building so that the nonprofit would be able to take over the property, operate it economically, um, part of the financing package would be a reserve set aside. Uh, ultimately, that's the um, solution for some small property owners who... New owner. A new owner. The, some small property owners perhaps maybe are not suited. They're in the wrong to, business. They're in the wrong business. <laughs> and, uh, and we have encountered that in the past. These are the properties that we go to year after year after year and find the same problems year after year after year. And ultimately... We, we, keep, we keep at them, and we come back every year, and we keep citing things, and ultimately I think they make the economic decision that it's just not, it's not in their best interest to continue. So we'll, we'll introduce them to MHP or AHC or some other nonprofit who we will help then develop a financing package to purchase that property. 
to, to that. Go ahead. Briefly add that one of the things that the district created, um, just in terms of best practices, uh, was a low interest, uh, actually my, yeah, I think it was a zero interest loan program specifically targeted smaller housing providers. Um, I mean, we talked about this at the evictions hearing. You know, what what often happens is small housing providers. It's not necessarily always willful activity. They just don't. They may not have access to the resources. And in this context, we're talking about financing. And it was only. I think the program was probably funded at a few million dollars, which, considering the the district's portfolio, wasn't significant. But again, it was that issue of, you know, uh, these are properties that need some infusion of cash uh, to make some necessary corrections to the conditions at the property, and they targeted specifically smaller properties. Yeah, thank you. And, and just to your point of over and over and over again, same property, same issue, and you go into that. What's our, I know this regulation doesn't change that, but what, what is our, you get the same thing over and over again. What's our ultimate remedy outside of get, convincing them, hey, maybe financially it'd be better for you to do this? What, well, each time we go out there, they have to make the repairs. Um, otherwise, they're subject to the citation and going to court, and a judge will order them to make the repairs. So the repairs do get made, but they operate on such thin margins, or philosophically, um, their decision to invest in the property at such a low level will just, just enough to get by. Just enough to get by. So we'll go back out the next year, and we'll encounter the same problems again. Um, so we always. When we go out, they always will fix what we find. It's just, again, we'll go out next year, and it'll be the same situation. Right. And it's the definition of, like, kind of fix, short-term fix, long-term fix. If it's a systemic thing, you know, rodent infestation, if you just put down, if you just kill the, the current crop, but there's, they're in the building, they're, they're coming back, right? Right, so, and I suspect example. that now that we, if we approve this system and we have a troubled property s system, these are the properties that will, uh, a, a lot of small properties will appear on that, and we will... It'll just, maybe we'll allow us to have more conversations with them about exactly. And there's nothing that says that we can't go back out more than more than once a year. If this is a habitually uh, a hi habitual problem with this property, there's nothing to say that we can't go back out more. And ultimately, the enlightened self-interest of the property owner yeah. maybe will help them decide that they are in the wrong business. Thank you. Tom? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Guys, thanks for uh, your attention to this. Um, it's, uh, it's nice to see some progress in this area. Um, uh, just curious, the, the bill passed back in 2016. Why did it take two years to get the executive regulation done? Um, when, when the bill was discussed, there was a very uh, lengthy conversation about having a two-year surge, during which time that we were in, uh, uh, inspect a sample of every multifamily property in the county at the end of which time we would develop a troubled property list. Mm -hmm. So right. we've been working on this regulation. Actually, we've had the framework in place for over a year, but we wanted to right. sample it against the real world results uh, to see if we were on the right track with this, recognizing that the um, surge would be done on June 30th, 2019. We felt like we were moving Surge would be complete. It would be completed, I'm sorry, that we would have this regulation in place. And it was sent over to the council in October of 20, uh, 2018. OK. Um, and I am glad that you've moved to the larger multifamily focus over the, the fourplexes. Um, and I appreciate you did, you've completed now the full inspection of the enclave. I'm glad to have that report. There's much more to do there. Um, you had begun by inspecting just 20 percent of the enclave and found four or five hundred violations. Help me, and then I, I appreciate that you, I wrote a letter urging you to do the full inspection. The county executive agreed, and you've done that, so thank you, because that's a lot of work. Um, and I'm glad that you have now the inspectors to perform that quickly um, due to the new um, inspectors that we funded. Um, Help me understand just the thought in your work plan. If you if you're inspecting a, a large building and you find twenty and you find hundreds of violations in just twenty percent of the units and they're health and safety violations, why would you stop at twenty percent? Isn't that sort of a cause for alarm and a, a call to get to thirty percent or forty percent or the rest of them? Well, not all of the violations at the enclave that were uncovered under the twenty percent were health and safety. Not all, but many, many were. 
and we knew that was the case. Uh, it was actually under 10 percent, I believe, that were health and safety violations. The other were the other were what we would consider under this system to be low, moderate, or lower, medium priority. But regardless, regardless, we had already violation. intended to do a 100 percent inspection of the enclave as we were res as we were reviewing the results from the 20 percent inspection. We realized, especially with the mold situation that was out there. Uh, we realized that we needed to increase that. So that decision was made to do that contemporaneously with when your, your letter came in. And of course, we understood your concern in it as well. So we definitely we moved that up to as the soonest possible opportunity, which was in early January after the holidays. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you for the answer. I, I, I really think you want to avoid saying that you know, we didn't have a high level of health and safety violations. To the tenants who are our taxpayers who are paying all of our salaries, they don't want to hear that there's, that a small number, that 10 percent is a small number of violations. When you're talking about mold that causes them headaches every day and damages their uh, ch children's ability to concentrate in school and gives their children asthma and them asthma, um, those are conditions that should never be allowed in Montgomery County and for them to go on so long and for your department to have to be pushed to do the inspections that's your responsibility. I don't think you want to say on camera that it's a small number of violations because if you lived in those buildings I don't think you would look at it that way. Well the issue of the mold was being handled separately. Um, we realized that that was a problem and we certainly were concerned about that and that it, the, we had a separate corrective action plan uh, from the owner to go and inspect every unit and to identify the problems out there. When we realized that that probably would not be enough, that's when we stepped in and decided that we needed to take a stronger approach. Thank you. I am just giving you some advice. I don't think that's a good look for the department or the county. Number two, number four, once approved, how quickly will you start charging increased fees for the repeated inspections? We've already started it, although we haven't had the actual situation arise. We're ready to charge reinspection. You're ready to start, yes. and you will as soon as you do repeat inspections, or as soon as we pass the regulation. Yes. So Great. it's not it's not on the reinspection, but it's on the second reinspection. <coughs> Thank you. Um, and then um, finally, I just it's not a question, but um, I appreciate uh, Nicola, you you're raising the the concern about landlord increased cost to landlords. I've I've certainly heard the department and this committee um, remind us all at different times that landlords incur, voluntarily incur higher repair costs if they ignore preventive maintenance for years. So if you're at the Enclave where I was repeatedly recently and you find mold and you just wipe it off and then you paint over it but you don't get to the mold in the, in the, uh, the drywall um, or if you, as Councilmember Jawando said, you just put down a little bit of rodent um, poison but you don't actually deal with a widespread infestation then you have a bigger bill later and you know I hope I hope we're doing everything we can to remind our landlords that they have to either pay now or you pay later but you're usually going to pay later if you don't do the preventive maintenance because that I know that's been a focus of a stated focus of your department in the past so not a question not a, just a statement as I said and I thought I had a sixth oh on the troubled properties list thank you for making that um, Surprised it took as long, but I'm, I'm, I, you got the, the good obvious ones on the list. Um, Flower Branch is on there. Thank you for that. Did you also consider Good Acre, which has same owner, same management, shared management office across the street as Flower Branch, where the last time you inspected it had hundreds of violations? Dan? This list here is prior to the physical data categories that we have here in the uh, Trouble Properties list. Mm -hmm. So this was just the beginning of, of this, we will definitely take a look at Pine, Pine Great. Ridge and Good Acres Thank to you. see where it falls. Pine Ridge, yes. It's severities. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know the, you know the drill there. Um, I was also, just the last thing now that I'm thinking of it, why did it take over a year to inspect, um, to re-inspect Northwest Park? And I think, and I, that was the case in Flower Branch too, because you knew those were, had hundreds and hundreds of violations. I think under the law we passed, do you have to inspect them every year? I can't speak to Flower Branch, but for Northwest Park, I do recall that the strategy was to work with the management company and to make sure that the least amount of tenants were impacted by the work that was being done. It's the same management it, company as Flower Branch. And it, yeah, and, and it, it was a longer approach to get the inspections done. I think what you've seen in the Enclave is, is, is the new approach now, where we go ahead, 
we find a property that needs more intensive inspections and we just go ahead and we do it all and we do it in a very quick period of time because the point is is to find all the violations and to make sure that those violations get corrected so that will be the the focus case going forward yes okay gentlemen thank you for your attention to this thank you well uh thank you and i and i had mentioned this to the chairman and he had graciously agreed i i would love an update once we get rolling with this, I expect this is going to move forward. I think, uh, and and the sooner we can, you can get it implemented, and we can get an update on how things are going, and get the new list. Even you know, as soon as you develop it, run it through the rubric of the. Since these are going to be slightly different, that would be great. And and Linda, to you too. I think w when we have another hearing on it, I'd love to see the uh, alignment between these pro the pro troubled list properties and the eviction properties. And I think we need to be looking at this holistically about. Where are the trends and analysis? As I mentioned, there are at least four or five of these on this list that are in East County. There's, there's concentrations here. If you go down Lockwood Drive from the Enclave, I think we're going to see patterns, and I think that's going to be important in how we prioritize what we're doing and do the outreach and do the remediation. So I just want to flag that for you. It's not really a question. You can comment if you'd like, but that I think we need to be looking at these things uh, in lockstep and, and, and hear back from you sooner rather than later once you do that analysis. Okay, um, well, I guess I take a different view on the actions of the department. It seems to me that you were under-resourced for a long time. I think Councilmember Hucker had an important point when he proposed additional funds to the department to add inspections so that we could be more assertive in our inspection approach. I don't really view the department as having been uncaring or, uh, you know, indifferent. Um, you know, I've got rodents in my house. It doesn't make me a bad dad or, or a bad person. You know, it's just sometimes there's challenges. So I think the department has really been, you know, working hard. And I feel like you had a very data-driven approach coming out of that landmark legislation that we passed. You wanted to inspect all of the housing and then work from there. And that made sense to me. So I, I really, you know, I just don't see evidence that somehow the department was not doing its job. I think there's code inspectors who wake up every morning with their heart and their work and they're doing everything that they can. And I think the department leadership has been pushing forward. So I, I kind of regret the, the, you know, the tenor of the conversation around the department's actions. Uh, it seems to me the department has been fulfilling the intent of the law with, with fidelity. And um, I don't really, you know, I just, uh, I think we're on the same team here. All right, so I think we've talked this through. Any changes? I don't see any. We have a technical adjustment. There's a technical adjustment. And then the question was what? That'll come back to the full council. I think we're all in agreement here, as I understand it. Andrew? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to vote. I think we've talked about this quite a bit. I think just speaking, uh, just piggybacking off of some of the reporting uh, requests, I do think the idea of the financing side of it, both the county's program and, you know, which on, you know, which of the properties on this list are we actually helping through that uh, program to try to solve this problem and not just identify uh, problems which should be part of our our goal and I believe it's where the department is uh, is headed and then just to you know continue to look at this you know question of uh, of, of financing and of whether or not this actually uh, is is a challenge I think it you know if this were an issue probably would have been easier to deal with it when the legislation was being considered as opposed to during the regulatory process. Uh, but I think continuing to look at it and to identify it, and if there are issues, real life, you know, practical challenges with the name of the identified properties, and if there are ways that we should be addressing that, you know, down the road, just like we're going to have to continue to look at these uh, regulations, I'd personally be interested, and I think the committee would benefit from having some of that reporting and, and yeah. proactive information both from the, the department. Omelet. We're not yeah. going to make the omelet again. We'll watch it closely and see how it goes. Thanks. Yeah, and I just think, you know, the regular reporting would be helpful so we can actually take a look at how this is working in the real world and whether there, you know, if there are unintended consequences, we can address them at the appropriate exactly. time. All right. So 3 thank you very much. Good discussion. And we will come back. I think we have April 1st identified as a potential date for a 
or a briefing, a briefing on the topic. And we're also going to include single family homes right. in that because I think that's relevant to the accessory yep. dwelling unit conversation. Right. And a majority of housing code enforcement is from the Department of Housing and Community Affairs, but we'll invite um, permitting services and HHS to also participate so that you can have discussion about when other departments are the appropriate one. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much.